Good afternoon, and welcome to the Johns Hopkins 30-minute COVID-19 briefing, where we provide live insights from the experts who lead our work at the Johns Hopkins Coronavirus Resource Center. For the next half hour, we'll focus on what you need to know right now about the COVID-19 pandemic and public health responses. As part of this briefing, we'll have an opportunity for live Q&A with our experts, and we'll be offering these 30-minute briefings regularly on Fridays at 12 p.m. I'm Dr. Lainey Rutko, a professor at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, and I'm a member of the leadership team for the Johns Hopkins Coronavirus Resource Center. We'll be providing answers in real time today, so please submit your questions for our experts in the box at the bottom of your screen. As always, there is much for us to discuss, and today I'm joined by two of our experts from the Coronavirus Resource Center. First, Dr. Jennifer Nezzo is a senior scholar at the Johns Hopkins Center for Health Security and an associate professor at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Jennifer will give an update about the public health implications of the COVID-19 data. Then we'll hear from Dr. Brian Garibaldi, who's the medical director of the Johns Hopkins Biocontainment Unit and an associate professor at the Johns Hopkins School of Medicine. Brian will give an update about the treatment of COVID patients. I'm now going to turn to each of our speakers for a brief overview. Jennifer, first to you. It feels like vaccines are more widely available, but overall we are seeing a much more mixed picture than last week and some concerning trends. So my question is, how worried are you? Yes, thank you, Lainey. Thank you, Lainey. That's uh, exactly what we are seeing, un unfortunately. Um, so I am quite encouraged by the rollout of, of vaccinations, and this is critically important. Unfortunately, I think we're getting a little bit ahead of ourselves. Um, we are now seeing a number of states, uh, in my view, prematurely uh, lifting public health measures. Um, in particular, I'm deeply worried about states that have list lifted mask requirements. Um, you know, possibly out of belief that, you know, the, the pandemic is behind us, that, that the worst has already happened. And I just have to stress that there are really no guarantees at this point. I am optimistic about the rollout of vaccines. I think we very well could be putting ourselves on a path to normalcy, but that is only if we continue to do the hard work that we have been done, that we have been doing and to continue to do that for the next few months. So talking a little bit about the numbers, um, Unfortunately, we have seen uh, cases um, increase this week, um, up about just over 7% as compared uh, to last week. Um, about 31 states this week have uh, reported increases. Among these, 17 have um, had these increases occur for, for two weeks or more. And I always look for at least two weeks to say that there's a trend. But nonetheless, the fact that we are starting to see um, you know, up arrows instead of down arrows is, is worrisome. And I think suggest to us that um, we may be getting ahead of ourselves in terms of just trying to go back to normal living um, before uh, the majority of us are fully protected. Um, deaths do continue to decline, but you know we often see that deaths uh, follow cases by you know a month or so later. So we have to, of course, be worried that this could translate to additional deaths. Um, a particular worry is the uptick in hospitalizations that we're seeing um, in, in multiple places across the US. Um, this is wor worrisome because what we're doing with the vaccines is hopefully uh, reducing um, the severity, uh, protecting people so that they are, are not likely to become severely ill um, or die. And when we see an uptick in hospitalizations, that suggests that we have real gaps in our vaccination efforts. Um, what we saw in or seeing in uh, Michigan, I think is possibly instructive where um, the, the greatest increases in hospitalizations are occurring um, between people who are you know, between 30 to 50 years of age. These are probably people who are not yet prioritized for, for vaccine. And so um, what this means is that even um, as vaccines are rolling out, um, until the vast majority of us become protected from them, we remain vulnerable um, from this virus. And if people get infected in the interim, we could see an uptick in both hospitalizations and deaths. So um, we have to, I think, double down. Um, there are no guarantees we can turn this ship around. Um, and I hope we do so um, in, you know, and, and make it headed in the right direction but I don't wanna see additional weeks of, of sustained in, increases in cases. That would be quite a worrisome sign when we are, in my view, so close to the finish line with this pandemic. Thanks so much, Jennifer. Before I turn to Brian, I want to remind our audience, please submit questions for Jennifer and Brian in the box at the bottom of your screen. 
Brian, I'd like to pick up on what Jennifer mentioned about how we're now seeing an uptick in hospitalizations. And um, I'd love to hear more about what you're seeing in the hospital. But my, my main question to you is from a clinical perspective, what do you see as the key developments over the last several weeks? Well, thanks, Lenny. So, you know, I'd like to echo what, what Jennifer said. You know, here in Maryland, we've seen a slow and steady rise, both in terms of daily cases, but also in the number of patients who have been hospitalized. Uh, over the last week, uh, we're just maybe starting to see an uptick in ICU cases, um, and it's un, you know it's unclear if we're you know not seeing that rise in ICU cases just because there's going to be a delay as we've seen previously, or maybe there's some impact of of vaccines uh, potentially protecting some of the most vulnerable. But you know I, I think we're we've got a million confirmed case mark here in the U.S. Um, you know, we've had close to 600,000 deaths. And to put it in, in, into context, you know, people are raising the alarm bells about Brazil where the epidemic is widely out of control and they've just passed 100,000 cases per day. You know, that they're in rare territory and, and we've gotten ourselves 55, 60, 65,000 cases a day. But if things continue in the wrong direction, you know, we could find ourselves right back in, in sort of the lead in the number of new cases per day. Um, you know, I'd say also anecdotally, you know, I've seen a lot of patients and, and even had family and, and, and friends who have, you know, made it a year without getting COVID. And, and now as things are starting to relax a little bit, I've had a lot of, a lot of patients get COVID, you know, right before they're getting their vaccine or maybe a couple days after because, you know, it's really important to remember that it, it takes you at least two weeks to develop some immunity from the first shot of the Pfizer and Moderna don't have full efficacy from those shots until two weeks after. And, uh, and that's true of the Johnson & Johnson single shot. You know, really it's two weeks after vaccine before you're gonna have that those protective levels of immunity that we've seen in the clinical trials. So I think it's just a word of caution to people that it's not to take your foot off the gas pedal. Um, on the clinical front, there have been a number of different developments over the last few weeks uh, since I last spoke to, to folks here. Um, there's some data coming out of the hospital uh, looking at, at trying to use blood thinners to prevent blood clots. Early on, I think many centers, including our own, adopted a more aggressive um, preventive strategy using higher doses of blood thinners to try to prevent blood clots. There have now been two studies that have shown that in ICU patients, using more aggressive anticoagulation actually does not change outcome board. We're still waiting for some data looking at using higher dose blood thinners in patients before ICU to see if that perhaps prevents ICU uh, admission. Um, there's a drug called molnupiravir which is an oral antiviral agent. Uh, they released some data over a few weeks at a, a, a nationwide ID conference uh, showing that using that uh, pill in outpatients who have symptomatic COVID decreased the time it took for people to clear the virus from culture. Um, we're still waiting to see what that translates to in terms of clinical data, you know, that they get better faster. Does that reduce hospitalization rates? Does that reduce death? Um, but that at least the preliminary data is promising that maybe there might be some more that we can use as outpatients uh, to try to prevent people from getting very sick. Uh, there's been some new data on the monoclonal antibodies. Um, so there's a new antibody uh, developed by uh, GSK and Veer um, that was shown to limit hospitalization to outpatients early on in their disease course. It's very similar to some of the monoclonal antibodies we've seen um, from Eli Lilly and Regeneron. Uh, but we also have seen that some of those antibodies, particularly the single antibody by Eli Lilly, Bamlin, Nivimab, um, it's not effective against some of the variants that are circulating, the Brazil variant, the South African variant, uh, some New York and California variants. And so the U.S. government has actually stopped single doses of Bamlin, Nivimab, and it's probably no longer an effective monotherapy, although the combination therapies still do appear to be effective in combination against the variants. Um, and we're still about some of the therapies that we've known about for a while that are likely to improve outcomes, particularly in hospitalized patients. Our group just published a, a study looking at remdesivir, a retrospective study showing that large NIH study, the ACT study, uh, patients who received remdesivir got better by an average two days compared to people who didn't get remdesivir. So we're still learning about how some of these therapies in the real world uh, impact disease. And one, one of the nice things about some of these new real world trials or, or studies is that they include much larger portions of, of underrepresented groups that were not necessarily present in, in the initial clinical trials. So we're starting to get some real world data that remdesivir probably is effective. On a much happier note, if we think about other things that are happening in infectious diseases, you know, this is a time of the year where we usually are in the middle of our flu season. 
Um, and here at Johns Hopkins, we've only had two cases of flu the entire year. At this point last year, we had hundreds of cases uh, across the board. A number of tests that are positive for is less than 0.1%. Uh, so we're really at a seasonal low across the country in terms of flu, which is great. And that's also true in terms of RSV, another respiratory virus that's particularly challenging for little kids. Uh, we really have not seen much in the way of RSV, which suggests that so that we're taking protect ourselves from coronavirus are effective against these other respiratory viruses. There's probably also some, um, you know, th these viruses also tend to, to spread more in schools, more so than we've seen with COVID. And so the fact that many school systems are, are still doing hybrid learning or at home learning probably contributes to the low uh, incidence of those infections. But that's definitely a bright spot. You know, we have not seen that combined flu and coronavirus or RSV and coronavirus hitting the health system at the same time. So I think that's something that we should uh, be uh, happy about right now as we look to what's going to happen over the next few months. Thanks, Brian. That, that is great news about what you're seeing, or I guess I should say not seeing in terms of flu and, and RSV in, in the health system. I'm now going to turn to um, questions. As always, we have a lot of questions for both of you today. Um, Jennifer, I'm going to start with you. So we're getting a few questions along these lines. Would you say that we're potentially on the, the edge of a fourth wave in the U.S., or, um, or do you think we're seeing some kind of seasonal variation, or is it something else entirely? So I do think that cases are going up, and my, my guess is that the reason why they're going up is in part because there have been some spring-related travel opportunities. People are probably headed to places that they weren't um, in the weeks prior. Um, but also that uh, we've now seen a number of states relaxing restrictions. And you know, when states relax restrictions, it probably has two effects. One is that it gives people more opportunities to congregate and potentially spread the infection, but also it sends a signal that perhaps um, worries about the pandemic are over. Um, so I do think that probably people are, you know, at this point hearing about vaccines and hearing about the good progress, hearing about the restrictions being lifted and sort of assuming that it means it's safer to go out. Um, I have to remind everybody that while we have made really important progress, um, we still have dangerously high case numbers. Uh, and, you know, I, I am hopeful that we can get ahead of it with our vaccination efforts, but there are no guarantees. I mean, it is still possible for this virus to outpace our efforts to vaccinate. So it is really important that one, people continue to protect themselves um, in the, you know, the next uh, few months until they get vaccinated in particular. Um, just because it's open doesn't need, mean you need to go and certainly uh, wear a mask even if your state tells you not to. Uh, that is critically important. Um, I, I, I don't fully expect us to see a case surge like we saw in the winter time, just because we are being um, you know, much more aggressive with vaccines than a number of other countries. But I think we have to remain open to the possibility that we could see um, a concerning rise in cases and, um, you know, what could follow is more deaths and hospitalizations. It's really a shame because we have these vaccines right now that are, we need to just get them into arms and to reach people before they get infected. And so that's why this, this period right now is so crucial. If people can just kind of hold the line a little bit longer until they get vaccinated, I think we will be in a much different place. Um, I think the summer could potentially be much better than last summer. And I think by fall, we could you know, be feeling more normal again, but that is up to us. And I think that we are at risk of losing the progress we've made um, if the trends that we're seeing right now don't, um, you know, the trends that we're seeing right now continue. Thanks, Jennifer. Brian, a few questions for you related to the, the so-called COVID long haulers. And I, I guess first I, sh I should ask you to just say a few words about what, what that means exactly when we say long haulers and COVID. Sure. So long haulers is one term that people are using. Another term that's that's made it into, I think, the press and also from the NIH is the post-acute sequelae of COVID or PASC. And these are people who are now, you know, more than two months out from their acute COVID infection who continue to have symptoms that are new or different from the way they felt before they had COVID. Um, and we're seeing that, you know, depending on the question you're looking at, you know, in some studies, up to a third of people who have had COVID will experience these symptoms two months out uh, in hospitalized patients that may even be older. And what we're trying to do is how much of this is related to 
being sick, having a viral illness, and you know having you know these sequelae that last. You know we've seen this in other viruses like influenza, for example. We know that this happens to people who are in the intensive care unit, where they can have long-term symptoms, depression, post-traumatic stress disorder, weakness, shortness of breath, particularly if they had respiratory illnesses. Uh, but we're trying to figure out how much of this might be specific to COVID. And so the NIH actually just this week um, has collected a number of from across the country to try to create these large cohorts of people who have recovered from their initial COVID infection but are still having symptoms. So we can ask how prevalent is this? You know, how many people are at risk? What are the risk factors for it? Are there things we can do for people who are acute infection that can decrease the likelihood they're going to have these long-term symptoms? And really to understand, you know, just as we've seen COVID has actually disproportionately affected underrepresented minorities, you know, we really don't understand what the distribution of these types of long effects are going to be. Um, and since we've had millions of infections, you know, we've had over 30 million documented cases, probably many more than that in the U.S., this is likely to be a really important um, thing we, we're going to be dealing with uh, as, as a nation, but also in our healthcare systems for years to come. So this is a critically important issue, and as we're moving you know, towards hopefully many acute COVID infections, I think you're going to hear a lot more and more about how we need to marshal resources to deal with this patient population. And again, I would just say that the best way to avoid getting long COVID is to avoid getting COVID. So get vaccinated if you haven't been vaccinated, practice social distancing, wear a mask, and, and really pay attention to the, the types of activities you're doing while we still have a lot of transmission going on in the community. Thanks, Brian. Another, another question for you. So throughout the pandemic, we've um, all heard and, and learned a lot about what it means to, to be on a ventilator. What is, um, for those who have been on a ventilator for one week or, or beyond one week, what, what do we know about um, how that's likely to impact their ultimate recovery from COVID? Yeah, so, so again, we're, we're not sure how much of this is specific to COVID and how much is related to being critically ill in the intensive care unit. What I usually tell patients, um, even before COVID, is if you're in the intensive care unit, every day in the intensive care unit is really five to seven days of recovery time. And so people who get COVID, in many cases, they're on a ventilator for you know, 10 to 14 days. And that really means that it's gonna be months before they recover. And unfortunately, many patients end up needing to go to rehab facilities to relearn how to walk, uh, to be able to you know, regain their, their speech and their motor function. Um, and you know, I, I, I do think, it's important to, you know, just get cancer of caring is an amazing thing, but that's just the beginning of the journey. And we do know that, you know, up to 10% of people who have COVID who get out of the hospital, they actually get readmitted to the hospital with, with secondary complications or continued issues from that COVID. Some of the things that we know to look out for, we certainly have to look at uh, things like depression and post-traumatic um, stress disorder. You know, it's, it's very um, difficult to be in an intensive care unit, to be on medications that sedate you. Um, a lot of people are confused and develop what we call delirium during their hospitalization, uh, which takes some time to recover from. So we know that this, this idea of brain or, um, you know, forgetfulness will continue. But we also, you know, years out from their hospitalizations for lung-related uh, issues in the ICU, some of them never get back to work. Many of them never re return back to their pre- illness uh, level of physical functioning. Um, so I think we have a lot of work to do for the you know, thousands and thousands of patients who have been hospitalized and severely ill with COVID. Many of them are, are gonna be recovering for months. Thanks, Brian. And another, um, another question for you. As, as a clinician, what advice do you have for those with pre-existing conditions who are about to get um, their COVID vaccination? Uh, I would say, good for you, get vaccinated as soon as you can. And, uh, you know, I know uh, Bill Moss, who's usually with us from the Vaccine Center, always says this, for the vaccine that you think you want, you, you should take whatever vaccine is available when you can get it. Um, all of these vaccines are highly effective at preventing severe disease and death, um, and they're all very safe. Um, we, we have a lot of patients uh, who have pre-existing conditions, you know, heart disease, lung disease, diabetes, kidney disease, even patients with immune system problems. And we have not seen any increased risk of side effects in those at-risk groups. 
Um, and we really have seen a benefit when you look at the, the trial data, but if you also look at the real world data, particularly what's coming out of countries like Israel, you know, they are really seeing wonderful effectiveness of, of vaccines in decreasing symptomatic illness, decreasing hospitalization and decreasing death. Get vaccinated as soon as you can. And this applies to everyone, not just people with pre-existing conditions. Thanks, Brian. Jennifer, I'm seeing several questions about variants. So I'm, I'm gonna head over to you now. Can you tell us generally, what do, what do we know right now about the B117 variant in the United States? Um, we have a pretty good sense that it's increasing. Uh, I wished our um, surveillance for the variants were better. Um, part of the problem is that we hear about the number of cases that are of these variants that are reported. Um, the, the better way to look at it is the percentage of the sequences performed that come back as the variants. That gives you a little bit more of sense of the frequency, but even that can be misleading because sometimes we only sort of sequence the, the cases that look concerning. I know there are some places in the US that are taking a much more deliberate approach to looking for the variants in, a, in, a, in an attempt to try to assess the prevalence. But so far, all the signals we have suggest that it is increasing. Now, um, there has there is potentially signals also in the data, though less clear here, but certainly has been demonstrated in other places that um, there is increased transmissibility from people who are infected with this variant. There have been a few clusters that look potentially concerning. Um, so, so that is obviously something to be concerned about. And there have been questions as to whether the surge in cases um, that we're seeing now is being driven by the variants. Uh, my guess is that the variants are playing some role, but also so is the fact that we are relaxing our efforts to control all of the virus and not just the variants. The good news is the tools that we're using to control the spread of the virus still work on the variants. So the social distancing, wearing masks, getting vaccinated as soon as you can, those are important tools to stop the spread of this virus, variant or not. Um, and you know it's important that we do that as quickly as possible so that we don't see emergence of other variants that have even less desirable traits. Thanks, Jennifer. And you, you mentioned all the tools at our disposal. So no surprise, we are also getting several questions today about what we know in terms of the vaccines and, and the variants. So from your perspective as an epidemiologist, can you talk us through that, please? Yes, so um, the good, I'll just tell you the good news. The vaccines still seem to work pretty well against the variants. Um, and so this is our best hope. Um, protect yourself until you're able to get vaccinated. And then once you get vaccinated, I think that's gonna reduce um, your worries a bit. We still have to do some things um, until the vast majority of us um, are, are able to be vaccinated. But um, really right now, the, the measures that we have been using for the past year are still gonna help us uh, outpace the variants. Thanks, Jennifer. And this next question, I'm gonna I'm gonna start with you, Jennifer, but then I'm also gonna give Brian an opportunity to to respond. And the question is, what can um, public health professionals like us or healthcare professionals like Brian be doing now to address um, the misinformation or disinformation that's circulating about um, COVID generally about vaccines? Can you give some some examples of of what's happening? Sure. So um, this is something that I've learned a bit more about in this last year, being really absolutely stunned by the level of mis and disinformation I've seen circulating. The key thing for public health professionals is not to um, share that information. Sometimes I think, you know, those of us on social media see something and we want to rebut it by replying to it or retweeting it and then putting the, the correct information over on top of it. Don't do that. Just share the correct information and, and, and keep doing that. Do that when you talk to your friends, when you talk to your families, when you're online, just keep sharing the right information and really try to drown out um, the misinformation by sharing the, the right information. Unfortunately, on social media, if you, if you share the wrong stuff and try to correct it, you actually may wind up amplifying the wrong message. So that is, I think, really the, the key thing. And I will have to tell you, you know, I have to say, we've done now a number of sessions with here and, 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 you know, other types of briefings, talking to people about vaccines. And, you know, I think it's, it's totally understandable that people feel hesitant initially about vaccines. Um, and I, I do think it is possible to talk to people and to answer their questions and give them the right information and hear what they're concerned about and have them at the end feel much more confident. So I would encourage people to have those questions in a judgment-free way and just understand that people need to come to a 
point of acceptance. And sometimes that means just talking through their concerns and getting more information. A lot of the same questions keep coming up over and over again. So I think the more we have those conversations, the more that information, the right information can spread. Thanks so much, Jennifer. And Ryan, I want to give you a chance to weigh in on this one as well. So things that all of us can be doing to best address the misinformation or disinformation about COVID that's circulating out there. I think it's important that we're open and honest with each other and in the conversations that we're having, you know, and, and having events like this, I mean, this is one of the better ways I think that we can reach people. Um, you know, I think you have established the Coronavirus Resource Center as a trusted resource. Uh, and so every opportunity I get to, to come on this, this program, I'd love to talk about what we're seeing in the hospital and, and be upfront and honest about what we know, what we don't know. Um, and I think as Jennifer said, you know, engaging people openly about, you know, what what are your what's your hesitancy about getting the vaccine? Why is it that um, you know you're you're not necessarily listening to public health requirements or suggestions? Um, and really trying to just understand where people are coming from because a lot of the behavior that we're seeing that doesn't seem consistent with what we know about ways to protect the virus is coming from this misinformation or lack of understanding or or lack of belief about what's what's coming out there. So I, I think you know I, in my part I you know I, I try to discuss this openly with friends, family, with my patients. But I also try to, to help out whenever I can when someone contacts me from the media or you know, asks me to speak about certain things. I try to make myself as available as I can to, to talk about what we're seeing and, and to try to um, you know, be upfront and honest about what we think the best strategies right now are based on what we know and, and recognizing that what I say today might change with how science evolves. I mean, the, the pace of scientific discovery over the last year has been staggering. And uh, you know, I think we have to be upfront and honest and, and be willing to say, hey, you know what? Two months ago, I thought this, and, and today, you know, a little bit differently. And, and I think we have, to, we have to follow the science where it takes us. Agreed, thanks. And Brian, another question for you. So you, you spoke a bit in your opening remarks about um, clinical treatments and, um, and where we are right now. We're getting a, a question, if, if you could say a bit more about availability and, and what's more widely available or what might soon be be available. Can you can you give us a sense of what's out there? Sure. So so the only um, you know FDA approved treatments are for hospitalized patients, right? Remdesivir is the one FDA approved treatment. Um, the other therapies that are and, and dexamethasone repurposed drug. Um, the the other therapies that we're talking about are available under so the the monoclonal antibody therapies. Uh, which are, you know, ways of boosting your immune response to clear the virus quicker. Um, we're still learning how to use those drugs. So, you know, we know that in hospitalized patients, by the time you're sick enough to be in a hospital, studies have clearly shown that those drugs do not help. Um, and so it's really about trying to understand, can we get people tested earlier? And if we get them these therapies early enough, will we really see a real world decreasing hospitalization and death? Um, you know, I think we have not, the, the problem with the monoclonal antibody infusions is that they're, they're infusions, right? They take several hours to administer. You need to have a site to do it. And, and we know that our healthcare system has been stressed first with getting testing centers to be able to identify where the virus is, but now actually getting vaccines into people's arms. So I think there's been a little bit of tension trying to figure out where to deploy resources. And, and I think right now the vaccines are really what's going to get us out of this. We still do not have that magic pill, you know, the molnupiravir that I talked about. We haven't seen the clinical data yet, so it would be amazing if that becomes a therapy. But right now, we don't have an oral drug as an outpatient to prevent you from becoming. Thanks so much, Brian. We are closing in on 12:30, so you got the last word today. I'd like to thank Jennifer Nezzo and Brian Garibaldi for joining me today and give a big thank you to our audience and especially to those who submitted questions for Jennifer and Brian to answer. This briefing will be archived and available at coronavirus.jhu.edu. And as a reminder, we will offer these regular 30-minute briefings on Fridays at 12 p.m. In each briefing, we'll focus on what you need to know right now about the COVID-19 pandemic, and we'll have an opportunity for live Q&A with our experts. I'll look forward to seeing you at our next 30-minute briefing. Until then, thanks and stay safe.